This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click the show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the speakers of our morning ethics program. Jay Courtney, the Honorable Elizabeth Pfeffer, and Michael McGuire. Jay Courtney was admitted to the bar in 1988 and spent 32 years trying cases for injured plaintiffs. He's tried over 40 cases to verdict in both state and federal court. He proudly served as president of the LA chapter of ABOTA in 2018, leading the chapter to be selected chapter of the year by National ABOTA. He currently sits on the boards of both Cal ABOTA and National ABOTA. He's a member of the International Society of Barristers, and in 2020 was selected for membership into the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, an organization limited to 500 fellows featured members from 40 different countries. He's tried diverse cases that included mass torts, medical negligence, products liability, business disputes, and bad faith claims, which he now mediates as a full-time neutral. Next, we have Judge Elizabeth Pfeffer, who's retired from the Los Angeles Superior Court after 13 years of service. Judge Pfeffer served nearly her entire judicial career in the downtown Los Angeles Stanley Moss Courthouse. She presided over an unlimited jurisdiction civil independent calendar court for six years, a civil trial court for three years, and a family law court for four years. Judge Pfeffer has presided over more than 75 civil jury trials, more than 500 civil bench trials, hundreds of evidentiary hearings, and numerous settlement conferences with a diverse range of complex factual and legal issues. Judge Pfeffer is available as a mediator, arbitrator, and referee in all areas of civil law and family law. Lastly, before recently joining ADS yeah, Services, like, yeah. I know I Michael can't. McGuire spent 44 he, 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 years he, 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 as a trial he, attorney, first yeah. as a I prosecutor of sexual assault and homicide cases, and then handling a wide range <laughs> of civil litigation matters with a particular emphasis in the field of personal injury, property damage, homeowners association disputes, and uninsured and underinsured motorist cases. He tried more than 100 jury trials to verdict and was responsible for litigating thousands more. Actively engaged in the American Board of Trial Advocates, Mike was president of the Foundation of ABOTA in 2014, the recipient of the Joseph D. McNeil Civility Award in 2015, and national president of ABOTA in 2019. Now, Mike, passing it to you. Actually, before you do that, Hayward, uh, you need to turn my video on. You I'm not it. able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One sec. All righty. Locked out there for a sec. Good morning. Sorry about that. Welcome, Judge Pfeffer. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Hayward, thanks for that kind introduction. Good morning to everyone, and welcome to Civility Matters, a program of the Foundation of the American Board of Trial Advocates, commonly known as ABOTA. I'm pleased to be here with my ADR colleagues, the Honorable Judge Elizabeth Pfeffer retired and Jake Courtney as, as also an ABOTA member as you just heard. Our presentation today will end at 11 a.m. and will be, uh, you'll get two hours of legal ethics credits for attending this session. So why do a civility program for lawyers? Fortunately, most lawyers practice honorably, civilly and professionally. Most understand that as attorneys, we, have, we hold the public's trust and have an obligation to engender and protect respect for the rule of law. Most know that it's important that attorneys conduct themselves with integrity, ethically, and with civility and professionalism. Unfortunately, too many slip too often and treat each other, clients, staff, the court, public, poorly and unprofessionally. Some lawyers feel that being tough and aggressive is their role, and it results in them bullying and intimidating people acting in civilly. Let's just be clear, sending expletive-laden emails and letters 
is not civil. Look at this example in Crawford versus J.P. Morgan Chase, where plaintiff failed to pay sanctions, harassed opposing counsel, made contemptuous statements to the trial judge, brandished a pepper spray, and even discharged a stun gun at a deposition. Obviously, despite repeated efforts and classes such as this, discussing civility and even court decisions, incivility persists. Recent course, recent course, excuse me, recent cases underscore that the nation, this profession needs a wake up call. We need to understand how important it is for us to conduct ourselves and, hold, and raise the level of esteem with which the profession is held today. The purpose of civility matters is to instill values and standards that promote high regard for the practice of law. Today, we will discuss what it means to be civil and uncivil, feature actual examples of uncivil behavior, which I warn you will include many swear words and inappropriate behavior, but we wanna show it to just to let you know what's out there. We'll provide citations to relevant attorney oaths, statutory and case law, and rules of court and rules of professional conduct. And we'll suggest some tips, techniques, and share some lessons. Jake, how timely is this topic of civility? You know, Mike, it, it couldn't be more timely. Uh, you know, we live in a, a very contemptuous time right now where politically uh, we're just past the anniversary of January 6th. And uh, what we see is a behavior outside the legal profession uh, that uh, is, is uncomfortable. And as lawyers, we should remember that we went to law school, we took the bar, and we took an oath uh, to practice in a professional way. And I think that what we're seeing is that, it, you know, we can't let the world around us dictate our behavior. We have to keep our standards high and we have to really do everything we can to keep it civil, to, to, to maintain our professionalism, to, to do everything we can to better our profession. And we have to remember that, that we are a profession. This isn't, this isn't a job, this is a profession. We're here, we're here to provide services to clients and uh, it couldn't be more timely. Judge Pfeffer, uh, do you agree? And, and do you have any other insights into the state of affairs today and maybe why? Right, well, look, we're in a contentious time. I mean, uh, I mean, I remember when I was a, a new lawyer, you know, quite a while ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not that long ago. Well, quite a while ago, but uh, yeah, and I was, uh, you know, a member of our law school ends, ends of court, which unfortunately, you know, disbanded after a few years. But, you know, even when I was a brand new lawyer in the early nineties, we we're taught about civility. You know, I was part of a panel that the state bar had to teach new lawyers about civility. I've attended many programs. I'm sure. I'm sure this is not the first civility program that lawyers have attended. Uh, you know, other judges of the LA Superior Court have given it. Um, these cases have a lot of great examples. But I think part of it is the bar is so large in Los Angeles and in California. I, I mean, just having been, you know, a judge with an IC calendar in downtown LA for years, I mean, there's still, I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of lawyers, and there's still some, I've never heard of them. <laughs> and so, and, and my, uh, my former colleagues who were in the criminal courts told me many times that they found the criminal courts to be, uh, obviously there are exceptions, but in general, they found that the lawyers were more civil in the criminal courts because every judge is, you know, your public defender and your DA and you see the same people, you know, city attorney, the same people all the time. And it's a smaller bar, but it's civil. It's more anonymous. I mean, you, you do, and, and when you do have more specialty bars, people do, you know, are more cooperative. But part of it's the anonymity. It's almost like if you're driving, you know, the road rage. You know, you flip someone off, you'll never see him again. But if you're driving a company car, it says, how's my driving? You know, I'm driver number, you know, cart 127. Here's the 800 number. You know, supposedly studies show people drive better when people know who they are or they could be found out versus it's totally anonymous. And, uh, and my friends who still practice said that, uh, and who've practiced as long as, as I've been in legal professions, that just over time with you know, emails and texting and 
you know, in the old days, you'd send a meet and confer letter to opposing counsel and you think about it and read it before you put it in the envelope. I certainly would. I'm sure opposing counsel did, but now it's, you know, text, you know, F you, F you, <laughs> you know, you suck. And so kind of like the rapid responses, you know, someone sends you a text, there's kind of expect a quick response. Part of that, I think, is less time to reflect and deliberate. So I think, so to some, I think just the, the number of lawyers, the relative anonymity, and just kind of just technology is everything's faster now than it was 25 years ago. Your Honor, just to drive that point home on how many lawyers there are, uh, my father's watching this this morning. He's 86 years old. His bar number is 20,000 and change. Right. Uh, I was admitted in 1988, and my bar number is 136720, about 100,000 lawyers between us. Last month, my two children got admitted to the bar, and their bar numbers are in the 338, 338,000. Um, now, some people have dropped off on the lower end, but the, the number of lawyers out there, you're right, it, it's staggering. And it used to be, it used to be a smaller community where you would see the same lawyers in court every day. You know, if you were working at the Torrance Courthouse, you saw the lawyers who went to Torrance every day. If you were in Burbank, you went, you saw those lawyers. Now, you know, the, 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 the whole practice has become much more statewide with uh, video appearances in courtrooms. You can, you can appear anywhere in the state and you can take on cases in a broader area and you may never see that lawyer again. And that, that, that is part of the problem. If you don't know the people, if you're not friendly with the people, uh, your, your, you know, your tendencies might be to, to become uncivil. Um, you know, Mike, I, I think it's good that you warned uh, people. We have a, uh, 980 people currently watching this morning, which is a great number. Uh, many people because of COVID are in their homes and they may have children home from school because of the current uh, limitations with COVID. So excellent to warn that uh, when we, we say some words today that we may not normally say in our practice or in our, our day-to-day lives, but um, we're going to say them today because it's important to drive that point home that uh they are just words, but said in a harsh tone or in a combative tone, uh, they become uncivil. And so I think it was excellent of you to make that warning. Thanks for doing that. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. So um, let's, let's move on here. Um, there's going to be several references to Aboda here. This is an Aboda presentation that uh, we're presenting with their uh, blessing. Uh, Aboda has worked to promote professionalism and civility across the country, including spearheading convincing state bars and, and uh, Supreme Courts to include or add oaths of professionalism, civility, and integrity to the attorney swearing in oath. In fact, that's been the case here in California recently. This map shows the states that have added oaths to their admissions, swearing in processes, and I understand it's actually a little out of date. There's a few more states that have signed on since. These new oaths represent a further commitment to civility and recognition by the judiciary, including the Supreme Courts and, and, and the state bars of the need for an oath. As I mentioned, in 2014, the California Supreme Court added California rule of court, which is now 9.7. And it's, it requires everybody being sworn in to swear at the end of, the, of their swearing in. As an officer of the court, I will strive to conduct myself at all times with dignity, courtesy, and integrity. Aboda's first rule of professionalism is to remember the practice of law is first and foremost a profession. And, that we, and to remind us that we have a professional obligation to treat people civilly and with respect. You know, I, I think one thing that we ought to also be mentioned here is that too many lawyers don't look at our practice as a profession as, and look at it more so as a business, an occupation, a way to make money. And in the, in the, when they forget that, they place money, profit, and winning at all costs over principles. And we have to remember that the law, legal profession is a profession. Right. Judge Pfeffer, yes. um, you mentioned the American Inns of Court, and they have a wonderful 
um, uh, swearing uh, or oath here. Would you would you mind discussing that a bit? Sure. So if we review, you know, kind of the characteristics of the profession again. I mean, I, I sometimes in in court when things would get heated, I would kind of tell people think back to the day when. Remember when you applied to go to law school, when you were excited to get that admission letter and excited to go to law school. And then, of course, once you take the bar and you excited to get your bar results, excited to get sworn in. It's a big deal. Kind of remember, you know, you know, the idealism of youth, if you will, of just why you wanted to go into the legal profession. It was, you know, to be an advocate. I mean, you, are, you know, you're the voice of, of your clients and it is a profession. And it's, it's the justice system. It's, this is how, you know, the justice system is supposed to be about fairness and following the law. And, and you're the advocate for people who can't speak. And so the American Inns of Court professional creed kind of distills that of, you know, we want to preserve the highest standards of excellence in the professionalism, ethics, civility, and legal skills. And again, it's essential to achieving justice under the rule of law, which is what we want. We, we have, we're a nation that with, with the rule of law. And lawyers are a part of that. And so, again, it's the oath. It's a learned profession. And we have the standards of dignity, civility, courtesy. You're an officer of the court. You know, and I, again, there are times I remind lawyers of that. Of You know, you're an officer of the court. What that means is when you stand up in court and you tell the judge something, it's supposed to be true. The court, the judge is supposed to take you at your word. That's what officer of the court means. So these are all important, encouraging the respect for the law. Uh, after some of the you know, lengthier, more challenging jury trials, I would write letters to, uh, to the lawyer, uh, to the, uh, the jurors, thanking them for their service and kind of following uh, the model of uh, Judge Victor Chavez, who's a beloved trial judge of our court and presiding judge. He had surveys for, for jurors to give us feedback. And so you know, I, would, I would ask, the jurors, what can we do better? And, you know, and I would get feedback from every kind of every batch I would send out. And I wrote an article about what jurors say after a trial. It was published in the Cal Advocate a few years ago. But the, the jurors would comment on the conduct of counsel at, and of the article. They speak too loudly. They question witnesses too aggressively. We think of that. nailed them on cross-examination. Well, jurors don't like it when, look, and this isn't to say you're a pushover, and, but there, there's aggressive and there's too aggressive and jurors would notice that. Lawyers are too aggressive against each other, jurors would say. Um, one said, I tried very hard not to let myself or the other jurors be affected by anything other than the evidence presented. That said, it was almost a relief afterwards to express some of my disgust for this particular counsel's histrionics. So, you know, you want to win, right? But jurors don't like the uncivil behavior. Judges don't like it. Opposing counsel is like it, but more importantly, jurors don't like it. They, so this is part of tying into the creed. Jurors expect, you know, courtesy and professionalism and they expect advocacy, but they want people to be professional and lawyers are professional. And so when people, when lawyers are in court and they act uncivil, contrary to the creed, it, it's distracting. So again, respect for the law is your conduct in court, instilling a respect for the law. So, and, and the rest of the, the oath is there, but it's, that that's part of it. So, uh, Jake, the, uh, when the ABOTA members and uh, officers, what, what does it mean to be civil? It, you know, it, it's a great question because it's, it's, it's very easy to define what it is to be uncivil, but, but looking at it from the perspective of, you know, how should you behave? And, and it really comes down to, you, you kind of know when you see it. I think, you know, even the most civil lawyers, uh, Mike received one of the highest honors you can, the Civility Award from National Boda or from his chapter. It means Mike is, is good most of the time, if not all the time, but all of us, all of us slip. All of us find ourselves in, in a spot where, uh, you know, we, we do something and the minute we do it, we, we know we shouldn't have. And, and that's kind of your internal uh, monitor telling you, you, you've crossed that line, you're not being civil. Uh, kind of one of the goals today of this talk is to you know, take, take us through some scenarios. We'll look at some depositions and we'll look at 
uh, other other times where these things most commonly present themselves. But it, it, it really means, you know, you can still be a zealous advocate for your client, but you're just not going, you're not going over the top. You know, this is, uh, you know, you know, we have zealous advocate and, and, you know, fanatical and compromising, but that's, that's a zealot. And, and that's not zealous. Zealous means you, you, you understand your client and you understand your case and, and you're passionate about it. You know, you're, you're devout, you're devoted. You, we see the words on the screen and they're, they're, they're important because that, that's what we're trying to, to find is that level of professionalism, but where we don't go too far and uh, avoid the name calling in court. Uh, you know, uh, we, we hear a thing where, where attorneys are addressing the court and, and they'll use kind of this false civility. Uh, you know, uh, Judge Buckley, who was the presiding judge in Los Angeles, used to always talk about with, with all due respect, and we'll see a little clip on that here uh, from Baby Blues. A- anytime you start your sentence with, with all due respect, you know, here, you're a loony bird. With all due respect, you're a booger face. It, it, you know, you're, you know you're not, whatever the next thing out of your mouth is, it's not going to be civil. Uh, Mike, why don't we go back and show that clip because I think it's, a, it's appropriate. wasting time with this is because the deposing counsel ordered the husband to leave the room without any justification whatsoever. So, uh, Fred, once again, you're, and I, I say this with all due respect, you are one of the most ignorant people I've met in a long time. Right. And, your, and your comments, and your comments about this are ridiculous. No, we're just going to stop. Let's then leave. Back. Mrs. Lee is not... I mean, you're trying to take advantage of the fact that she's upset by continuing to argue. And no, Fred, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that you're being a jerk and, and, and that you're being an idiot and a jerk and you've been this way the last two depositions. And I would re- really respectfully ask you to just sit there and be quiet and make appropriate objections, if you're going to make any at all, without making a speaking objection. Now, if you want to get on with this deposition, please do. But in the future, don't okay, interrupt me with meritless comments. I think you're the one that needs to get on with the deposition. Going sit down, this. Fred. No, sit down or get out. Me. Why don't you get out? Uh, I, you got you it, want, Fred. You want to go in the hallway? And then do what? What are you going to do in the hallway with me, Fred? What adult, what mature gonna thing? What are you going to do? I'm going to walk out of here. What okay. adult, mature thing are you going to do in the hallway, Fred? Huh? Uh-huh. What are you going to do? I didn't ask you to go in the hallway. No, you... Why are you standing up? What are you doing, Fred? What are you doing? You're, again, seriously, your, your true strength are coming out. for the witness? Sit down and shut up. It, you know, Jake, the, after uh, watching that, you got to wonder what the witness is thinking and what her impression is of the profession of law. Right. And, and wondering why she hired this lawyer. <laughs> yeah. exactly. You know, you know I, I think this clip is, is a good example because it shows that uh, bad behavior kind of brings on bad behavior in others. And, um, you know, we don't know who these two lawyers are, but, but once one got the other going, it, it created this kind of terrible deposition and it's something that, you know, creates a, a learning opportunity for us, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for not to have these clips. We want to get to the point where when we try and talk about civility, we can't find these clips. This clip's from, you know, only five years ago. Um, and you know, we have more modern clips. We have some older clips too, but this is, this is a problem that's existed a long time. And, and, you know, being, being civil takes work. Uh, and for some, it takes more work than others, but we're trying to make sure people are aware that, you know, there are consequences to what, what happens. And we'll talk in a little bit about, you know, sanctions and, and, you know, things that happen to people who are uncivil and, and how it affects your practice. Uh, which, which kind of then, you know, changes the, the topic to, you know, uh, you know, I'll ask you, Judge Pfeffer, uh, what's it mean to be uncivil? Right. Well, I, and there's certainly an example of it. And, and that clip from the deposition reminded me of, uh, of something that happened in court. I, you know, I, I had a family law assignment for four years and we all had court reporters. And then when I went to the civil court in uh, 2012, that was around the time when the LA Superior Court had to let go of its, you know, many of the court reporters. So in the civil court, you know, you have the you know, court reporter comes in for hire to do the law in motion or the trial or whatnot. 
And many of them were the former court court reporters. So they're setting up and I say, hey, how's it going? Uh, you know, out in the real world of uh, private practice. And one of the court reporters who was an excellent court reporter, uh, she said, I'm not doing depositions anymore. I said, well, what do you mean? And again, her whole career as a court reporter was for the LA Superior Court until recently. She said, the way lawyers act in depositions is I don't want to do it anymore. They're much better in court. I just won't do it. And so again, when you're kind of in the mix of civil litigation and you know, I was a civil litigator and I, you know, we all understand kind of the heat of the moment uh, in trial and, and, and tempers can, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, high stakes, but um, for instance, the lack of civility and the court reporters see it, you know, you're not scoring any points with, with the client when you do that. Um, you know, some lawyers would come in, I, I, lawyers in chambers. So we can't use the excuse of it's, it's in the middle of trial and you've got the surprise witness and the jurors looking at you. We're in chambers and one lawyer just turns to the other and says, F you. Just like, right there. what? Where'd that come from? So yeah, that's not civil. Again, it's, it's not acceptable in the courtroom for sure. And you will get admonished if you do that. But at least you could say, well, I, again, there was passion and, and, and zeal in my advocacy, but we're sitting in chambers trying to set a schedule and you turn to the other lawyer and say, F you, or um, in one of my family law cases years ago, uh, the contentious divorce and the husband apparently had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And in the hallway, the wife's lawyer apparently turned to the husband and said, I hope you die. Wow. And so he came into court and counsel, you know, wife, husband's lawyer said, Hey, out in court, here's what wife's lawyer said. He said, I hope you die. And I turned to him and he, he didn't deny it. Um, and the other lawyers and officer of the court, I thought that's, that's not civil. So there, there's just no excuse for that. But these are all examples of just, that's not how you should act as an advocate for your client. It's the opposite of civility. It's unprofessional. It's vulgar. It's rude. It's kind of everything we saw in that clip. You know, I, your honor, your honor, I agree with you. I think that email we saw at the beginning and the, um, the clip itself and that uh, statement from the Crawford case are all examples of being uncivil. Today, we're going to also talk about the California Civility Task Force, which is a joint project of the California Judges Association and the California Lawyers Association. And they issued a report in September with several recommendations. One of them was to add to the rules of professional conduct a definition of incivility. And it will add, assuming that um, it passes muster and is approved, this definition. Incivility means discourteous, abusive, harassing, or other significantly unprofessional conduct. Right, and another thing to think about uh, is, you know, judges all talk. And I, I was at the Stanley Moss Courthouse downtown, which is, you know, largest courthouse in the world, 100 judges, judges' lounges and meetings. I mean, judges all talk. So again, if, if you have a good reputation and you lose your cool for a moment in court, it, I mean, people still talk about that, but it's understandable. But but judges talk about uncivil behavior, and uh, you know, from time to time, like yeah, a supervising judge, family law or whatnot, they'll have they're civil they'll have like you know just informal brown bags with the lunch with the judges, or you know, just in the judges' lounge. And I remember one of these you know brown bag lunches were all sitting around, and one of the one of the judges said, "I had so and so in my court today, and so and so is a lawyer. We all knew." And our reaction was, I'm so sorry. We didn't even need to know what so-and-so did. It's so-and-so. That lawyer had a reputation for being uncivil and difficult and just, you know, again, so and it hit it home. No one likes it. Jurors don't like it. It's distracting. Opposing counsel certainly doesn't like it. You know, you don't want to be on the receiving end of it. Judges don't like it. And your reputation gets out. So, we always just kind of ask each other, why do you, why do you do that? I mean, why did you just say F you to the opposing counsel in chambers? So yeah, my, these, are, these are all important, important principles to drive home. Right. Mike, we got a question up on the board. Are uncivil lawyers more successful? And, and I think uh, Judge Pfeffer's point kind of answers the question. You know, if, if 
the sitting judges are talking about you and wondering why you do it, you know, it, it's going to affect your ability to give your client a fair trial. Um, it's going to delay the trial. Uh, it's going to interrupt the trial with uh, motions for sanctions and objections. And, and you know, uh, as part of, you know, ABOTA, we promote uh, the Seventh Amendment, the right to civil jury trial. And, and we got to remember that the jurors are there uh, giving us their time and, and helping us uh, find justice. And when they see lawyers fighting, it, it you know, I, I sure, I'm sure there are some uncivil lawyers who think they are more successful because of their behavior. Uh, I think the lesson that we're trying to teach is that's not true. It, it, it certainly isn't. And um, if you'll allow me, uh, remembering back to uh, a particular lawyer that I uh, litigated several cases against in the criminal side, things, uh, was a very successful, uh, accomplished lawyer in the sense of uh, he got big cases and did well in most of them. But he made life so much harder for himself and his clients uh, by uh, he practiced intimidation and bullying. Uh, and uh, unless you had been threatened uh, by his reporting into the state bar, you really hadn't uh, passed uh, a rite of passage yet in the criminal bar. Um, the thing about it that I always recalled, the lesson I learned was that his cases lasted longer. They were more hotly contested. They were, the, the, the uh, district attorney prepared for them more so, was ready to go more so. And, the, and it just cost his clients money and time. And many of them ended up in prison. I, I do remember, if, I, if you'll allow, one time when uh, he approached me and asked for a, a, you know, a, a deal in, in, in the courtroom halls. And I, I said, well, this is not the right time and place. And he went into a rant about how the victim had practically committed suicide. She, this is a wrongful death uh, homicide case. And um, there was a chance that this case would have been viewed as a voluntary manslaughter. Um, it was vehicular manslaughter, actually, at the time. And, and uh, we... Uh, he, he made this rant in front of the father of the victim, not knowing the father was there. And you, I can tell you, as a result of that, uh, his client went to trial, uh, no offers were made, and he ended up in prison. And it just so happens that you got to understand that how you act and what you say and unprofessional ranting can be unsuccessful. And it's not just litigation too. It can derail transactions. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, as far as jury trials, I mean, yeah, you know, and I would tell lawyers at the FSC, you know, when I was a litigator, you know, your goal is to, you know, your goal is to persuade and win, right? But when I was on the bench as a judge, I obviously make sure it's a fair trial and everyone's following the rules and the jurors aren't texting. But but part of it is to make sure the jurors are comfortable. And again, are, are uncivil lawyers more or less successful? What I've found. Is, you know, people don't want to go. You know, people want to be summoned to jury duty, but people get it. You know, you pick your jury, but then if your trials run smoothly, you know, without hiccups, you don't keep the jurors waiting in the hall and wasting their time. The jurors want to be there. And when they want to be there, they will pay attention. I assure you, they are all paying attention. One juror write a blog about her service on jury duty. They notice everything and they want to be there and they start to come together. And for instance, one of the comments is, from, you know, uh, one of the uh, juror comments that was in my article said the council should have refrained from comments on the other's professional conduct. It was meant to distract us, but it wasted time and annoyed us. So it's the difference between having a smooth jury trial where jurors want to be there. And again, when they want to be there, they will pay attention. And I can tell you there when there's a difficult case and I see you know, time for recess and the jurors are getting along and they're bonding and they're listening to each other. And I have more confidence in their deliberations when the jurors are like this and they don't want to be here. So it just, it's a, it's a more smooth process and just the fighting and just the name calling, um, it, it's distracting. And so you're creating jurors who don't want to be there. And again, it makes them work harder to do the right thing and follow the law because they know you're trying to distract them and they do pay attention. So even just having a jury trial move more smoothly. I mean, 
And flip side, when we talked about the large bar versus small bar, I found that the medical malpractice community, the med mal bar, plaintiffs and defense in LA, it's a smaller bar and those lawyers were all great and they were all civil and there was never a problem. And I remember sitting there doing huge medical malpractice trial. The lawyers were I'm fantastic, fantastic, zealous advocates, but they were so good and so professional. I'm thinking like, I could just leave and go down to Starbucks and come back in a half an hour and they'd still be going. They wouldn't be descending into name calling. But again, that's, they're all great lawyers. So again, some people may confuse civility with being a pushover. It's not. You can be a great lawyer who's also civil. Yeah, Mike, uh, looking at the cartoon on the screen now, I actually was in a trial where, you know, I heard this objection. And before I could say anything, I, I be- the judge interrupted and said, I believe you're looking for argumentative. <laughs> and then, you know, he made, he made a little light of it rather than chastise the, the lawyer, because I think the lawyer was in the moment. And, uh, and then the lawyer didn't do it again. And so I think, you know, part of today is looking for ways to diffuse situations and uh, kind of identifying uh, uncivil behavior and finding ways to tap it down, I think, is, is, is the goal. And I can say that lawyers who practice that way and develop reputation for being uncivil um, are rejected for admission into the American Board of Trial Advocates because one of the criteria is that you practice professionally, civilly, and and uh, with respect. Correct. Yeah, true. And again, those surveys also go to judges, not just members, other members of the bar. Right. So, um, questionnaires. So let's talk about maybe some lessons learned or some techniques for avoiding uh, the negative effects of incivility. Um, you know, uh, here, here's something that I, I practiced a lot. Uh, when I first got, I was basically, I was a trial lawyer, so I was, I was all litigation. But when I first got a case, uh, if I didn't know the lawyer, I'd call the lawyer up. Um, and I'd just say, hi, I got the case. I'm going to, uh, you know, ask to defend it. And uh, uh, is there anything we can, uh, you know, I should know ahead of time? Is there any way we can short circuit things? Uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, provide you what you need. If you, you know, I expect the same from you. And the thing is that the phone call helped a lot. It, it, it works better than a letter now these days, email, texting, et cetera. Um, it, it, it requires personal contact. And you can develop and start to develop a relationship with opposing counsel based upon your professional obligations to each other and your clients, and not based upon who's going to posture and and bully or intimidate, and harass and delay. So I think it's a, I think that's a good technique is to reach out to your opposing counsel and in person if possible, rather than a letter. I think it's a great point, Mike. I mean, literally sharing a donut. Uh, you know, at the Starbucks in the courtyard outside of, uh, you know, the Moss Courthouse, uh, you know, on, at the first hearing or even before is better because you're, you're going to avoid unnecessary motion practice. Uh, you know, the complaint may have a defect in it that instead of waiting for the 40 page demur, you know, simply having it pointed out to you by your opponent results in a filing of a first amended complaint with uh, the error corrected. And it, again, it, it goes back to being civil leads to cost-effective litigation. Um, and it, it does start at that first moment. Um, you know, and as we've all talked about, the, the size of the bar now makes it so you don't see the same people over and over again, unless you're practicing in a very limited area of the law. Uh, and so uh, it is, it's much harder to be... Uh, incivil to someone if you don't know them you know if you know them you're going to treat them better it's just that's just a fact right and, and i echo that too and whenever you know i get a new case as a litigator i mean i would think i'm going to be spending the next year and a half to two years with the opposing counsel so same thing reach out try to establish rapport and, and again you know you may be the one needing for a discovery needing a discovery extension from the other side so even if you're just not the most warm and fuzzy person just kind of your own client self-interest, you know, clients don't always get 
draft discovery responses back to you when, when you'd like them to get back. So, so it's, you don't have to be the best buds of the person, but just, again, that's what being civil and professional is. It's a, it's a profession on behalf of your client. You want to be cordial and professional and again, extend courtesies. I mean, the LA Superior Court local rules, we still have the uh, appendix 3A, the guidelines for civilian litigation that came from the LA County Bar Association and they're still enforceable. I mean, local rule 3.26 refers to them, but that's, again, as part of that profession is reaching out. Then just think, you know, depositions, you're going to be in their law office at some point, they'll be in yours. You know, it's, although everything's by Zoom, but it's, it's important to know. And, and factoring and getting to know your opposing counsel is certainly an important part of it. Yeah, one of the things I also try to do, Mike, is I took a lot of depositions and cases around the country uh, where you kind of take in the roadshow. You know, you, you and you and opposing counsel are going to Omaha or Jacksonville or Tulsa. And, you know, you don't know anyone there and you're spending days upon days in deposition, but inviting your opponent to dinner and saying, look, let's go to dinner. Let's not talk about the case at all. And, and learning about who they are and how they got into this profession and, you know, what's important to them. It, it, it breaks down that and it, it prevents them, you know, even, even if someone was terrible to me in the day's deposition, I'm, I'm still going to reach out to them because I think, you know, then the next day's depo might not be as bad. And, um, you know, or if I did something that I thought, you know, God, I was not at my best today, you know, here's a chance for me to apologize and, and kind of reset the clock and uh, try and make the, ne- the day, the next day a little bit better because it, it happens in baby steps. It doesn't always, you know, happen overnight. And um, working with your opponent is going to be a big part of that process. Right. Well, then also, you know, kind of the M word with that mindfulness, it's, it's you. How do you, you know, what are your triggers? You know, what kind of sets you off? What, uh, you know, if someone insults you, you know, you don't mix it up. He said, you know, wrestling with the pig, right? So you need to know yourself and be mindful enough to know these type of things get me upset. You know, these type of insults, because some, they just may be baiting you, but you have to make sure you don't take the bait, obviously. And also you just don't lash out. When you do get frustrated, do you start to use curse words, right? Do you start to, you know, your voice goes up and you start to shake your fist and get closer to the other person. You know, if, if that's you and you know, things can set you off, you know, you'd be more mindful of that. And I've seen lawyers in court, they, they start to do that and they you could see them think for a moment and kind of bring it back down or, you know, take a break or whatnot. So part of it's being mindful of kind of what triggers you and are you so competitive that you're going to start mixing it up with, you know, F you no F you, you know, right. That's what you don't want. You want to be able to, to take a step back as well. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. That, that uh, kind of is the other side of the coin I was thinking about is to model civility and professionalism, uh, which is don't take the bait um, and just 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 uh, respond civilly, professionally. And people tend to react to how they're treated. You treat someone badly, they're going to react badly. You treat someone well, they're going to react well. And I also think it's important to remember that your opposing counsel is your adversary, not your enemy. Um, and we sometimes, I think, in this in this field, it's a highly contentious adversarial um, field of practice, but we we sometimes look at the opposing counsel as the enemy. And it's it's important to step back and know that they're just doing a job for their client, uh, trying to do the best they can, uh, for the most part. And we may be. Uh, unduly sensitive because we're we're in the middle and the fray of battle. So I think modeling civility is important. Right. Well, and likewise, the judge is not your enemy. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you know, <laughs> argument on a motion and you can see the judge is not going to, you know, grant the motion that you filed or is going to, you know, grant the other side's motion. And, and I could see lawyers getting very frustrated and like, look, you know, so part of it's, you know, the, the, the judge may be wrong and that's what appeals are for. And again, the lunchtime talk of, you know, how was your morning? How was your law in motion calendar? And, you know, when colleagues would say, oh, you know, when I, you know, I denied this motion, the lawyer said, we're going to take you up. We're going to appeal you like, okay. 
you know, okay, you can appeal. Obviously, yeah. Supreme Court's not the final, but just lawyers get so upset. It's just, you know, yeah, we, we've all been- motion, the judge get maybe wrong, but it's it's a the judge is trying to do the best he or she can and you don't start well yeah i'm going to take you up and you're going to be reversed i mean i I had in chambers i got as as a trial judge i was assigned a brand new case and i had lawyers in chambers and uh you know oh how are we going to do the trial and and the lawyer's like well i'm going to start appealing you my wife made a single ruling but it's it's kind of this this knee-jerk hostility of I don't know what it is. Like, you know, I'm, I'm battling the court. And, and so people get heated and turn it against the, the court too. And, you know, judges need to take a step back to, again, being mindful. Like, you don't, you don't want the judge to think, oh, now I have to take a break because I'm starting to get upset, right? You want the judge to, to rule calmly and, and, and follow the law. So it really, again, doesn't help anyone to act this way. Yeah, verbalizing to the judge that you're wrong Rarely, yeah. rarely turns the judge around. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now that I got blowback, I'm going to change my ruling. Right? Oh, wait, you're, you're mad at me. I'm going to now change my ruling. And- granted, did I say granted? I meant denied, right? I mean, no. No, it's, uh, you know, but and then, that would happen. Way. Yeah. And then that's why we have appeals. And, 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 and sometimes we're wrong as the lawyers. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, sometimes you have to come to the realization that maybe your case isn't that strong. Um, and, uh, and that's hard because, you know, as advocates, we, we believe in our position. And, uh, uh, but again, keeping everything under control is, 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 is critical. Right. No, you lost the case because the judge is an idiot. Yeah. But I, and I, I hear lawyers, I mean, I'd hear them under your breath. I, you know, whatever, granted, denied or overruled or staying I'd hear the word BS. And I counsel, I heard that. Maybe you wanted me to hear that, but, <laughs> but I'd get that <clears throat> under the breath after ruling many, many times, who, who are you helping? And again, and I, I tell lawyers often, you know, when you do these antics, you know, there are a lot of lawyers in LA, lawyers in California. I think like, you know, is this the best lawyer this client could get? I mean, at a certain point, judges think that if this lawyer is such an uncivil bozo that maybe the client's case isn't that good because this is the because there's so many great lawyers, great civil professional lawyers. So again, you're not helping your client when you go to court and full of bluster and f you and BS. That's that's not helping your client. I'd like to add one more thing, uh, and that is to think before you respond or think before you send a letter or an email. Um, It's harder these days when the expectation is for immediate responsiveness, but uh, delay firing off an email or letter when you're angry, delay writing it when you're angry, sleep on it for 24 hours if it'll wait. Um, It makes makes a difference. Read it carefully before you send it. I think um, a word that means something different to you uh, is is perceived differently by the the reader uh, can... can, uh, uh, result in someone getting angry and so read it carefully. And again, I go back to my first point. Um, if I have a problem, had a problem with somebody, I called them first and it worked wonders. Then a letter was not necessary and, and uh, we preserved or created a positive, constructive, adversarial working relationship. Yeah, Mike, I, th- I think you're right. That, that, that history of where we've come from it used to be that you got a letter in the mail, you opened it, you read it, you were inflamed by what you read. Yeah. You you wrote a nasty response, but before it went out, it had to be typed. It had to be reread. It had to be looked at. And, and it, was, it, it was often that you would not send the first draft of your letter. You'd send the fourth draft of your letter after you've had a chance to calm down and to really think about what it said. Then we went to fax and, you know, you felt like, you know, you needed a, a more rapid response. And then emails came along and, and, and it really has changed the practice. I, I received a motion once where uh, the first line of the motion was my lack of response in a timely fashion. They said they had t- tried to contact me 14 times. Well, if you look at the 14 emails, they were in about a three hour window. And I was in a mediation or in trial or somewhere else. But, you know, someone writing that 
in a motion, if the law clerk or someone at the courthouse doesn't have adequate time to digest that it was in a short period of time, I look like all of a sudden I'm the bad guy. And so, you know, when we were prepping for this, Mike, you and I were talking and you told me that you actually found a way to even delay your email responses by giving you a chance to review it. Talk about that because I think it's a great tip. Well, um, I, I haven't used it in a while, but I put an automatic delay of 30 seconds, um, upped it to a minute and dropped it back to 30 seconds and then got rid of it altogether. But I would often fire off something and then hit send and then go, oh, did I really mean to say it? <laughs> did I say it well? And I'd look at it. I'd, bring, I'd, call, I'd call it back up and read it and say, you know, I think I'm going to call the person. Or, you know, I'm going to change this um, or I'm going to sleep on this and, and uh, just put it in drafts. So it, it actually saved me from myself more than once. Yeah, I think that the do-over is important. And, and our go-go... Don't read that email I just sent you. Yeah, yeah. Our, go, our go-go lifestyle. <laughs> you get my email? Don't read it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Ignore that. Ignore that. Yeah. yeah. Well, well it, it, today's yeah, world it, is text. Right. Well, an yeah. example of that, for instance, I mean, that's how so many of these examples of incivility come to light. So the court reporter example of depositions is, you know, how many you know motions to compel are there? And you know, certainly in discovery, there are legitimate issues of privilege and whatnot. And but some is just nastiness of just stupid objections. And you know, the meet and confer correspondence has to be attached. And I, I would say, I mean, the overwhelming majority of the nastiness, the incivility, is from emails versus letters. That again, the letters, no one's really calling names, but the email, like, you know, you suck. No, you suck. You, you know, you suck more. And, they, and then, so the, the court sees this. And then, then of course, the interesting thing is you have these horrible email correspondence in front of you and you're reading the motion. And then you have these lawyers in court who are just, you know, so professional and so nice. And you think, but, you know, if I weren't here, if the court weren't here, they're horrible to each other. Right. And so again, and, and a lot of these oaths and, and you know, our guidelines for civilian litigation, the LA Superior Court and BOTAs, you know, different oaths of offices, don't treat each other the what in a way that you wouldn't in court. So just kind of imagine there's always a judge reading your emails. But again, if there's a discovery dispute or some other dispute, those emails will be attached to the motion. So just when you write an email, just assume it's going to be attached. And again, not just in court, but it's out there There's with e-filing. Everyone can see every, everything yeah. that's been written in any case, you know, it's out there. So just, again, kind of underscore, just be mindful when you send an email because it will come to light. Well, I, I, this, is, this is great. And we'll share some more tips and techniques as we go along. But I, we need to move uh, forward. Uh, and I think it's good to keep this in mind. Uh, Shakespeare's famous line from Taming the Shrew. And do as adversaries do in the law, strive mad, mightily, but eat and drink as friends. And I, I, I've heard many, many stories where people established a little outside the adversarial arena relationship and worked wonders inside the arena later on. Yeah, and, and, and that's true. I mean, right. and that's what organizations like Aboda that is made up of both plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers that's what it does. It, it, it brings us together outside the courtroom where when we're trying to serve the greater good by teaching civility and uh, talking about preservation of the jury trial, it, it puts us in, in places where we can have that drink or that meal together. And then the next time we have a case together, it's going to be that much easier to get along and to, to get the case resolved. Right. So I've say I, I know Zoom makes things more efficient, but I, it's it's definitely been a loss. I think the last couple of years, uh, LA and statewide, that obviously bar groups have continued to have great online programs, but just going to bar events was it, it was you know kind of another bar event, but it, it was nice to go yeah. to you know county bar events or it, it just you meet lawyers from you know all across and you just you know, cocktail hour, you just talk to people or after the program, you, you hang around and talk to people. And, th and that is important to have that human connection. And I, and I worry that we've, we've really lost that with the zoom If you log on, you get your presentation and then hit the red button at the end. And you haven't talked to anyone else like, like you would. And I'm glad bar events are, you know, coming back. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, there was a time where I felt I was going to too many, but now they're 
there aren't enough. <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, we need we need to see each other. We need to be able to to socialize because that that is a big part of uh, solving what is is a problem. And, and Mike, it, it you know, the screen there says is, is lack of civility a problem. Yeah, it still is. You know, we have very recent case law, you know, citing to just terrible behavior. Um, you know, it, the, the, the good thing about the case law is it gives uh, judges a great opportunity to show us how clever they are and how well they write. Um, and uh, Kim versus Westmore was actually a, a appellate case uh, where they ended up sanctioning the lawyer $10,000 in the appellate court. And, uh, but it, it gave us this great quote, you know, it's time to stop talking about the problem and act on it. For decades, our profession has given lip service to civility. All we have gotten from it is tired lips. And, uh, you know, and then it, it went on to talk about, you know, needing to put teeth into sanctions. And when bad behavior is there, and when it's repeated, and, and, and most of the case law on bad behavior uh, is this repetitive behavior. It's not, it's, ne- it's rarely a single act. It's rarely a single outburst or one bad deposition. It, it usually is resulted in, um, as Judge Pfeffer mentioned, a bunch of letters or a bunch of uh, depositions. Now that we videotape depositions, you can really capture the, the tone uh, the written word, uh, sometimes there, you couldn't tell the anger of the lawyers from what they were saying, but if you were there, and then when you went to go try and get a protective order, you know, it didn't come across, but now there's, there's avenues there that, uh, you know, make it so much easier to get someone's behavior to be either tapped down or sanctioned through use of the court. Um, right. And well, and that's why the reputation again, going back to the example I gave where, you know, judges at lunch that had so-and-so in my court, you know, that's, that's a reputation that's not made from just, you know, one F you in the heat of moment and oral argument, right. To get that type of reputation, that's the repetitive, you're just a butthead and that's who you are. And, you know, we, you know, he's, you know, judges see the name of the lawyers coming in and go, oh, so-and-so is going to be in my court you know, maybe I'll put them at the end of the calendar. So the other lawyers don't see the antics of this person. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and get the self-represented folks out of there. So they don't think that this is the way lawyers are supposed to be. Again, right. you know, do you want judges like maneuvering around you? Like this is going to be a pain in the butt when this person comes in to argue the motion because of your reputation of this is the way you are. So again, the, the case law is helpful for courts in, in dealing with this behavior. Again, no one likes it and it is counterproductive. Yeah, Mike, Mike LaSalle was an interesting case because it was a case where uh, the defendants uh, took a default. I'm sorry, the plaintiff took a default on uh, a defendant who was an improper defendant who was a lawyer, but she was pregnant at the time going through a divorce and she had just lost her house in default. And she was, you know, late, uh, not, not in dispute that she was late, uh, but the rush to take the default and not set it aside and the subsequent behavior by the uh, plaintiff's attorney in that case ended up in the appellate court. And, and we got this observation from the court there that, you know, for years, the courts have been urging people to turn down the heat. Here, they talked about the zeitgeist, you know, too often. And that, you know, they've been trying, you can see the frustration in the court's writing here, that the bench has been, been decrying for decades with very little success. And, and that, that raises this bigger question, which is how do we make progress and, you know, have, have these programs worked? And, and, you know, I think we need to have more of these programs. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you go to church in the, on the holidays and, and the priest or the rabbi says, you know, where you've been all year in, in, you know, the, now we have 1100 people listening and the 1100 people listening today, maybe may not be the people who need the message. Um, you know, what we need to do is make sure everybody hears this message by making mandatory civility education mandatory. Um, this today is going to count for two hours of ethics. Uh, that, the paper that you uh, referenced earlier, Mike, makes a suggestion that one hour of mandatory CLE should be devoted just to civility. 
And it, it, it seems silly that we have to talk about it, but we do. We have to make sure everybody hears it and everybody practices it and, and learns tips on how to control their own anger and their own passion for their case so that it doesn't cross those lines. And then, then it's going to benefit everyone. Uh, we're going to have speedier trials, more cost-effective trials. And it's, 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 that's, that's what we're striving for. Thank, thanks, Jake. Uh, Great. We will be providing a list of cases, and there are several, particularly in the last five, four or five years, actually in the last three years, um, talking about civility and holding uh, lawyers in particular uh, in contempt and with sanctions. So yeah. we'll get to those. Yeah. Um, so what do you do if your client insists that you play hardball with opposing counsel? I, I imagine we've all had that, where the client walks in, uh, hires you and wants you to be Rambo, the meanest, toughest a lawyer on and make life miserable for the other side. Um, what, what do you do when you hear that from your client? Well, I think you need to let the client know right away that this is, you know, I'm, I'm an ethical professional. I will, you know, I will be your zealous advocate. I mean, you know, you have a duty, you know, undivided duty of loyalty to your client and uh, an ethical obligation to act with competence but just like there's a line of professionalism and I will not cross that line. I will be again, a zealous advocate and, you know, believe in your case and do everything, you know, ethically and legally. But again, there's a, there's an ethical professional line. So I will extend courtesies pursuant to our profession. You know, I'm not just going to be, you know, the, the advocate who's out there acting contrary to the rules of professional conduct. And again, you've, you know, your bar card is worth more than one case. And again, Fortunately, I've had to admonish lawyers about that sometimes of, you know, again, think of how hard you worked to get that bar card and how excited you were to be a lawyer and you know, the, the noble, you know, thoughts of, you know, my part in the justice system and being an advocate and, you know, being the voice for those who can't be heard. And then, you know, you, up, you uphold those standards. So you need to make it very clear to the client, here's the type of lawyer I am. If you're looking for, you know, the jerk who, you know, plays hardball and doesn't give extensions and, and just makes life miserable for the other side. I'm not that lawyer. So exactly. I need think, to make it the rules of the road very clear up front. I think the, exactly. I think the best thing to do is tell a client that's not how you practice. You have professional obligations and you found that it is more successful to, to practice civilly and professionally. You get better results with less cost. And if they want someone to be obstreperous and make life miserable for someone else, they should hire another lawyer. Yeah. And, and I think, I think coming from the plaintiff's perspective, it, it it's an easier decision. If you're a plaintiff's lawyer, the, the more disruptive your client is or wanting you to be aggressive, you know, you have one case for that plaintiff and it's easy to say, bye-bye, you know, go find another lawyer. And, you know, it, you may be trying to change a person. I think it's harder, and I didn't represent uh, corporate clients, but if, if you have a corporate client that is a big book of your business, that might be a harder, a harder decision because you, know, you may be walking away from you know, a primary source of income for your law firm. And um, then I think it does take you know, a, a, a hard discussion with, with the client to decide and help them understand that that's not how you're going to litigate, that you can be successful and that you've been successful in the past by not being that person who crosses those lines. Um, and hopefully they would respect that and keep you on as your, as their attorney. Right. And, but that's and what then, makes all the case law and, and the rules of professional conduct helpful too. Say, look, these are the rules. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. These and are the court can, rules. I have to follow them. And you can, ref you can, you can cite them too. And you should be aware of various guidelines um, rules and law. And we're going to cover these uh, relatively quickly right now, but uh, California attorney guidelines on, of civility and professional, professionals in section three requires that a, an attorney should advise current and potential clients. It's not acceptable for an attorney to engage in abusive behavior or other conduct becoming a member of the bar and an officer of the court. California Code of Civil Procedure, Section 583.130, or pretty, pretty much uh, all litigators are familiar with this, 
states in part, it is a policy of the state that all parties, all parties shall cooperate in bringing an action to trial or other de de disposition. So these, these are some rules that you can point to if need be, you shouldn't have to. And they're important for you to know that these are obligations. Uh, the judge mentioned, and Jake has mentioned meet and confer rules, uh, you know, California rules of court 3.724 and 3.727 require a meet and confer, require discussion and an attempt to ensure and resolve that the pleadings are at issue, discovery disputes uh, may be resolved without motions, anticipating other motions, agreeing to contest uncontested facts, narrowing issues, et cetera. Um, so there are, there are laws and rules and statutes that require lawyers to get together and cooperate, not to make life uh, difficult and fail to cooperate. And, and like Mike, that, and if, I, if I could jump in quickly on, on the okay. slide oh, about yeah. the, oh, sorry, the case management conference meet and confer. You know, as you know, on the, the CMC form, there's a box you check that we did meet and confer or we did meet and confer. And I, I can't speak for every judge, but you know, I mean, when I'd read it, I would look at that because the CMC is often the first time lawyers come in again. So many times I don't even know who these lawyers are. This is literally the first impression. And so if I see the box of we met and conferred, you know, it, it, they did not meet and confer, I would ask. And I want to know, if, am I dealing with like two buttheads or one butthead who can't, you know, is there unprofessional or, or is there a reason? Oh, I was, I was sick or yeah, I was in trial or, you know, he wouldn't return my call. She wouldn't return my call. And so that's kind of an early tip off of, is there going to be a problem with one or more of the lawyers in this case because of the lack of meet and confer? Or is it, again, I was engaged in trial. I'm so sorry. I didn't have a chance to meet and confer. But that meet and confer is important. And again, it's a tip off to the judge of how is this case going to be litigated? Is this indicative of what's to come over the next year and a half, two years? Mike, talking about that same concept, in, in federal court, a lot of times the meet and confer is uh, ordered to be face to face. In, in state court, California rules of court do not require it be face to face, but we're, we're always looking for opportunities to try and make people better. And I would suggest that, you know, picking up the phone and then setting up a meeting face to face and having them over to your office or volunteering to go to their office and meet them in person just, it just makes it that much easier. If they're on the phone and you're saying, you know, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? It's easy for them just to sit silently and to not cooperate and not participate. But if you make the effort to go to their office and, you know, and, and like I said, bring some donuts, you know, bring a, bring a box of cookies, you know, make a gesture and, and sit down and have a real conversation, you're going to streamline issues. It's going to make it harder for them to you know, you know, not look you in the eye later because you now have this relationship. And so I, I think part of this is, again, identifying where you can solve problems and that a meet and confer is a great opportunity to, to extend that olive branch. If there's been bad behavior in the past, apologize for it. If, if there's no behavior and there's no relationship, it's a time to start a relationship. Agreed. Well, I think this is maybe a good time to get a little deeper into this uh, civility task force recommendations. We're going to cover Great. a few. Um, their recommendations, they made four. One is that the state bar mandate one hour of civility MCLE. The second is to provide specific training to judges on promoting civility within and outside the courtrooms. The third is asking the state bar to recommend revisions to the rules of professional conduct to clarify repeated incivility constitutes professional misconduct and is not consistent with jealous advocacy. And the fourth is asking the Supreme Court to require an annual oath of civility, the same one that new lawyers are now required to make when renewing membership to the bar. So with ref I, I reference this because this is the current situation we're in and, and the uh, State Bar and Judges Association have taken it more seriously. One of the recommendations is to amend Rule 1.2 to, to provide a little more clarity to what the scope of representation is. 
And it says essentially a lawyer shall abide by the client's decisions concerning objectives of representation. Um, and there, I'm leaving out a lot of words, but adds this language in, dark, in uh, bold. A lawyer does not violate this rule by acceding to requests of opposing counsel that do not prejudice the rights of the client, being punctual in fulfilling all professional commitments, avoiding offensive tactics, and treating with courtesy and consideration all persons involved in the legal process. That is one of the recommendations. Another yeah. one. Go ahead, Mike. Um, is with respect to the duty of diligence, there's a, they're adding a comment. This is rule 1.3. The lawyer's duty to act with reasonable diligence does not eliminate a lawyer's other professional obligations and lawyers should strive to treat all persons involved in the legal process with courtesy and respect. And I, I believe that means not using the required diligence as a, as a sword for somebody who needs an extension. That's kind of how I look at that. Right. Did you have a comment, Jay? You know, I, I was just going to say that um, uh, I know you've been a big advocate of expedited trials. And, and I think that first rule change, you know, really drives some, some of the points that, you know, eliminating the need to have a custodian of records come down to testify to the authenticity of a records when you know they came from Kaiser or Cedars or some, you know, reputable place. It, it, and there's ways that uh, we can streamline trials that will also help promote civility. And I think, uh, you know, that this, this change would be very important to give someone some reason to say, look, here, here, just let's, let's get along. Let's try and, you know, follow the rules and the rules allow us to stipulate to things. And, and, and if you get along, you're going to stipulate the things that are going to be for the benefit of both clients in the long run. Right. Well, again, again, preparing for trial, you have to submit a joint witness list and joint exhibit list to the court. And so, you know, that's part of the FSC, the final staff conferences, you know, court will go over the joint exhibit list and say, oh, you know, like 12 custodians of record, right? On a catastrophic injury case. Like, really? Do we need, can we stipulate? And again, the concern is by the time of the FSC, the lawyers, you know, and the local rules are already supposed to have met and conferred on that. So when a judge at the FSC sees all these custodians of record on the joint witness list, you think that they didn't stipulate to this? And so again, the court will try to, to elicit that. But when you see things on a joint witness list or things on a joint exhibit list when there's a lack of stipulation, again, the trial judge may mentally think, is this going to be a difficult trial that they already can't agree on you know, admissibility of these four photographs, which everyone knows where they came from. So again, it's, it's a judge kind of getting mentally ready of what kind of case is this going to be? Is this going to be just a clash of personalities and, and again, lack of civility or, are the parties going to cooperate and stipulate wherever they can? And again, the trial goes smoother. And that's important because again, the jurors want to be there and, and they'll listen. And you tend not to have juror problems when trials go smoothly. So even at the FSC, when a judge sees a lack of cooperation, that could be a red flag sometimes. Thank you. Um, judge Pfeffer, um, uh, I've noted that some lawyers have complained that uh, their, their new associates in a firm and their law partner is teaching them to practice uncivilly uh, and expects that of them. How do you respond to that? Gosh, flashbacks to the first few years of practice <laughs> <laughs> firm. But uh, I, think, I think people actually are kind of more sensitive and attuned to the civility issue now that before it's, well, that's just the way that person is, just a you know, cranky person or whatnot. But you know, again, think of how hard, you know, think of why you want to be a lawyer and how hard you worked for that bar card. And just like, you know, bar card's not worth throwing away on a, on a client who wants you to do unethical things. Same thing if there's a, you know, the senior partner at your firm who wants you to do unethical things or be uncivil, uh, it's not worth your bar card. So, you know, first again, make it clear if the lawyer, you know, if the senior partner says under no circumstances, do you give the other side any courtesy, no extensions, no this, no that. And telling you to be uncivil, just that's not the way you practice. You need to go to someone else at the firm. And I, 
I think if people practice law a certain way, I think, I think other people know. Stick at the firm of, oh, you know, this partner's, you know, the one who's, who will uh, butcher your work, right? Everyone knows that that's the partner who does that. So, you know, talk to someone else at the firm and look, you know, I'll talk about firm culture. If it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. It may not fit your style. That if you're being asked to compromise your professionalism and ethics, and that's a firm-wide issue, that may not be a place you want to practice law. That's great advice. Um, You know, I I guess, you know, you could always point out to your partner that there's attorney guidelines for civility and professionalism. Um, oh yeah, I would have done that as a first year to the senior partner. Excuse me, <laughs> rules of professional conduct say. Well, it, it, it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Like yeah. I said, it may not be a good firm culture for you. Exactly. Yeah. On, some... on that on that last point, Mike, I, I tried a case where um, I actually knew the partner on the other side, and uh, throughout the trial, there were some violations of of uh, motions in limine and always made by the young associate. And um, it, it was then this kind of apology from the senior partner. And uh, a year later, I ran into the associate and he said, oh, you know, I left the firm. And he said, I wanted you to know that all those things that I did, I did at the direction of the, the partner. And it, he said, I, I realized I don't wanna practice law that way. And he stepped away. And it, it really affected my relationship with that partner at that, at, at that firm because it, it was very insightful. And, but the, the, the gumption and the you know, fortitude of this young lawyer to walk away was, was the right play. And he, but it was hard for him because he had a very good job and it was a, you know, a, a big firm. And, and, uh, but you know, it, it is hard. And these, as Judge Pepper said, it would be hard to walk into the senior partner's office and cite to something that he or she should already know. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to do that, you know? Right. Well, and that's kind of what we talked about how large the legal community is kind of giving rise to incivility, but, but I mean, the plus side of that is there are a lot of law firms and, you know, people do change jobs because of just firm culture and not to say that people who switch firms is because, there's unethical conduct, but you know, you've got your style. And if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. And there are many other places to go. But again, you know, you as a young lawyer, you are building up your reputation with opposing counsel, with the court, you know, as big as the bar is, you will see each other again. And judges do talk and, and you don't want to, again, get that reputation of, oh, that guy. Or again, we've had judges say, oh, I don't you know. Oh, tell me about this lawyer. And, uh, don't trust that person. That person is not trustworthy. We'll lie. We'll do this. Um, you, you don't, you don't want to get that reputation. So again, your reputation and your bar card are far more valuable than this job at this firm. Couldn't, couldn't say it better. And uh, I imagine those conversations with a senior partner would be delicate, but you may not have to cite, you know, Hey, according to this, are you familiar with this, this rule or this guideline, but you might want to say that you understand, you know, we were taught that these guidelines exist and that's the way a lawyer is supposed to be. Right. See how it works. I like this quote from Ed, uh, Hanshian versus Xenon Pictures Inc. Um, this is also a case that uh, the, the site will be provided in the materials that are, that are handed out. There's no better guide to professional courtesy than the golden rule. You should treat opposing counsel the way you yourself would like to be treated. That's a simple one, one we all learn as, as children. And it really, I think, is still one of the best guides for uh, and maybe the best summary of uh, this whole presentation. Right. And that court does refer to the hardball tactics of one side. And, and again, that's, and, and again, replete references to the different rules of civility and professionalism and, you know, the general principles of professional conduct. Um, the court also noted uh, in that case, this uncompromising behavior of these hardball co- tactics undermines the truth seeking function of our adversarial system. And again, it's just, it's just creating static and noise that distracts mm. from jurors what jurors need to do, distracts from what judges need to do. It, it just, again, it's, it's distracting, if you will. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to be there to advocate for your client. And again, it's a, it's a truth-seeking you know, justice system. Well, I'm going to, uh, again, uh, let's see. Jake, 
um, we're going to show some videos and talk and show some examples. Um, but I'd like you to keep in mind, uh, maybe after looking at them, uh, what do you do at a deposition if your opponent improperly objects, coaches the witness, or insults your client? Sure. Let's take a peek. Here's a deposition transcript. I'm sure uh, most people can read it in case they can't. Uh, if you have the plaintiff's counsel at the start. Uh, we've sent you offers to settle. You've dragged us through this nonsense and you've been sanctioned $6,000. And yet you keep up this nonsense up. Now, well, let's take a lunch break. And based on your little uh, preface a minute ago, I'll go through with my client various paragraphs so we can come back in here and answer your questions. We are now at lunch. Defense counsel. Okay, fine. I would appreciate it if you would maintain your professionalism during interruption by the plaintiff's counsel. I cannot because you're an idiot. Defense counsel. I share that view of you based on your statements. Plaintiff's counsel. 6,000 in sanctions for your nonsense of wasting my client's time because you were for someone in your stupid company. Defense counsel. An attorney is entitled to that testimony. I don't know where you went to law school. Plaintiff's counsel, pay your damn sanctions. Uh, and, and obviously, Mike, this is one where everybody's bad. Yeah. And, and um, you know, the, the court reporter took it all down. Um, you know, you know I, I'm not saying you should go off the record and then behave badly, but certainly be aware when you're on the record and know that, uh, you know, this, this could come back to, to haunt both these lawyers because, uh, you know, they, again, they, they, they go into the mud and they, they find themselves there and then they, you know, make it worse. Um, and so, you know, it just, it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy that these examples exist. This, let's show this next clip. That's the whole problem that all ties together. That's what this is. All right, can we discuss this some other time? Now, I ask you to go off the record. You don't want to straighten it out. You don't want to understand. You don't want to save us the time. You don't want to understand Move, that this is all this has all been examined. Counsel. This has all been examined right. with other witnesses. So why don't you just tell me what the case is, and then I won't defend anybody? How about well, that? no, uh, you would defend them okay. more efficiently Thank if you, you know understood what, what had happened don't before. Need this on the on the record. I don't need your your lectures. So knock it off. I'm just responding to your question. I didn't ask you a question. If you look at asking, counsel, I'm not doing this. Ask him about counsel, 442. Stop it. Do you want to do this? Or you could check with the deposition from Tim Zion, where he went through all of this and explained all the problem with the Jocelyn switchgear and why they were the origin of the transients okay, so and how just... they were killing the surge arresters and how it was solved right, by the Siemens, Siemens gear and the pre-insertion resistors. You don't get to just have a, have a dialogue. Okay, I thought I was responding I mean, to your question. You, no, you don't. Should, should we take a tape of this and bring this to Judge Seymour and, and, and see how, how she likes your monologues? No. I don't think she will. No, I'm simply responding to I your didn't ask you a question. Jake, That's the whole problem. In the interest of time, I'm going to show this one and let you comment uh, sure. regarding both. Contents of your computer with regard to the searchable index that DuPont gave you, especially the field of addressees that say none, is DuPont's exhibit number one. Oh, is on, on. Council? I can't work like this. Calm down. Come on. Council? First of all, you have no right to even claim an exhibit. It isn't your deposition yet. That's number one, Council. So you've torn up, the, you've taken it off and torn up the exhibit. Sir, you're not going to touch it. How dare you? You are going to go before the Bar Ethics Committee on this one, son. We're going to quit the deposition right now for the day so that you can rethink what you're doing. Well, Jake, yeah, you, you, know, you want to start off? Sure, sure. In, in the first clip, it's interesting because the, the witness is very well prepared and knew to sit there calmly and uh, continue to read the exhibit. Uh, but the the... Kind of the speaking objection, you know, should be avoided by both sides. And to, you know, this kind of 
you know, make your objection, preserve your record uh, by, by following the kind of the training you received and the, the, the rules of the road in a deposition, you're, you're not going to end up with that transcript. Um, you know, the, it, it, it never plays well. And that's the type of thing that, you know, in trial might get played in front of a jury, even over your objection. Um, and so you should always be thinking through, you know, keep everything in check, stay calm, stay under control. In, in the second, you know, clip, it's, it's, you know, it's as bad as it gets. And if you practice long enough, you will find yourself in a deposition where people stand up, where people threaten each other. And, and it's hard. And what, what you have to do is you got to, you got to nip that in the bud. And, and it comes in your preparation of your witness and saying, look, these are the, these are the things you can never do in a deposition. And it will sabotage your case. It will sink your case. Uh, you know the uh, the aggressive behavior. You know on, on both part parties in this situation are just never acceptable. Tearing up an exhibit. I mean, it's it's this this is meant to show you for anyone who's been listening for an hour and a half and you haven't heard <laughs> what we said. This shows it shows you don't do this. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And if I may, I, I had one proceeding in court where the lawyer, it was very heated and you know, they lodged the deposition transcript. And so skim it. And so I kid you not, a fight like that broke out during the admonition, right? <laughs> like you've never seen my dining room table, have you? It's like, okay, this is not going well. If a fight is breaking out during the admonition, uh, certainly terminated deposition. I mean, in court, I had numerous depositions conducted in my jury room, people just can't behave. You terminate it and make a motion to the court. Um, they'll find a home for you. I mean, even when I was downtown, I would, you know, would finish the calendar, it wasn't in trial and I got a call from, you know, whatever court administrator, they're looking for a judge who wasn't in trial, who had an empty jury room. And I said, sure. So it wasn't even my case. And the lawyers were in there in a deposition and didn't hear a peep. So the, the, the times where we've had depositions you know, in my jury room, whether it's my case or some other judge's case, not a peep from anyone. Yeah, so think about that. That's with you, not even in the room. Right. Uh, certainly, you know, we, we talked about efficiency and keeping costs in your trial down and in your case down, you know, both those uh, examples would likely lead to a scenario where the court would read that and appoint a discovery referee. And, and that's, you know, you know, someone like judge Pfeffer now sitting in your deposition and the, the, your costs are going to go up. And, and strangely, you know, in cases where I did get a discovery referee appointed, it, it did change everything. You know, even if that person was simply sitting in the room quietly, didn't have to make a ruling because the behavior changed. And, and that's why this principle of, you know, and, and depositions are, they are the, they are the opportunity and, and unfortunately, and I think it, it merits comment, Mike, that and Elizabeth, that it's usually the young lawyer who is being taken advantage by a more seasoned lawyer who is going to, you know, play some aggressive cards. Um, you know, yeah, that, I've, I've been on the receiving end of that. Again, yeah, the newer it, lawyer of just yeah, like, what yeah. are you going to scare me? I'm going to cry and we're going to dismiss our case or, <laughs> but, right. you know, again, where does it? what's the advantage of that? Again, no judge likes to, I mean, no one, no one wants to be in the receiving end of that as an attorney, but no judge thinks any of that is good. And again, from a judicial perspective, part of it is I'm thinking, are you trying to hide something? Like right. if you just throw this big temper tantrum and yell and scream and F you, and you're hiding something, right? Or your case isn't as good. I mean, that's kind of an inference from it. If we have liberal discovery statutes. You know, there's a, a time and place for objections, but that conduct, again, you're, you're there to find facts, not to, to beat up on the other side. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important to point out that one of the recommendations from the Civility Task Force is to include conduct at depositions. Um, and they add a comment, uh, five, to refrain from incivility, the, the duty to refrain from incivility apply. So I think it becomes part of the framework where there would be uh, the ability to pose sanctions and uh, even 
eventually it's proposed uh, finding of misconduct. Right. What do you do if your client is uncivil? Well, let's see an example of that. <laughs> I'll read it. Um, wh how about your net worth, Mr. Jacques? What is that? Excuse me. Get off my back, you slimy son of a bee. I beg your pardon, sir. You slimy son of a bee. You're not going to cuss me, Mr. Defendant. You he's, he's repetitious here. You can cuss your counsel. You can cuss your client. You can cuss yourself, but you're not going to cuss me. We're stopping it right now. That's, you know, obviously there's a lack of client control by the attorney. I don't see the attorney um, uh, representing the client jumping in there. That's when we see the motion to withdraw as counsel in court saying there's been a breakdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here's another Mr. example. Patel, do, do you recall you may need to turn your sound up. A, res, a tenant from the Heartland Hotel to clean or do work at the sea, the sea captain? No. Sea captain? Yeah. Why are you talking sea captain? No, he's, she's asking about whether Just you... Just talk for Heartland Hotel. Yeah, yeah, Don't go is. to the other is. property. She is. She okay. Is. She is. Careful. I will Must be. careful for my other property. You want it to know about Hartland Hotel? That's all. Take it easy. If Raymond were... You don't pay the government corporate rent for my property. Why are you talking about sea captain? Raymond, you want to take a break? No, I don't want to take a break. She <laughs> don't want to talk my other property or for my wife or my children or any Raymond, other business. Who are she? Raymond, do you want oh, to take a break? Sure. No, I don't want to break. Okay. She is, Are you ready? Start to brainwash me. No, she's not. Watch it. Why people kill people? Go on, Raymond. Raymond. Can I have that last piece of feedback? Go ahead. Raymond. <laughs> My reporter, read that back. <laughs> what you want over here to eat other people's head? Okay. What you want from Hotel Hotel? Okay. We're going to take a short she break. She don't know your client yet. We're She's a liar. We're Number gonna, one liar. In San Francisco, I've never seen like you, woman. We're going off the record. This country. We're going to take a break. No, I don't want to break. I want to go home. You, well, you can't go home until we're done. Captain, Raymond Hotel, Industrial Hotel. Come on. What come you on. talking about? Come on, come on. Who are you? Come on. From my property. Come on, come on. Huh? You didn't door. pay me one copper cent on me. We're going out the door. Come on. Yeah, no, oh. but this is this is the guy who yeah. you might make the motion to withdraw. But exactly, you know, right. and, and the lawyer tries early, but doesn't try hard enough. I mean, you, you have to you have to realize and you should have realized in your prep of the witness that this witness is going to be difficult. And you don't get to say, would you like to take a break? You, right. you simply at the very first time his finger came up, his voice came up. That's your that's your signal that we're taking a break period. You're, you as the lawyer have to have control of your client to try and prevent this from happening. But then the real conversation that I would have with this client afterwards is, you know, I'm going to now show you what the jury's going to see at trial. And if you behave like this in trial, you will lose your trial. Uh, as a plaintiff's lawyer, you know, good, good plaintiffs make for good verdicts. You know, bad clients make for difficult uh, verdicts and hard, hard, it's hard to win a case when you have someone who who is out of control, right. uh, but uh, you know this was just a little too late <laughs> to, to save this one. Agreed. I, this this is a good example of you need to always prep your client and your party witnesses, prepare for it, head it off. You know, and, and if you think that the client is susceptible, practice. You know, find out what the triggers are and impress upon the client before the deposition that something like this could very well lose their case. Yeah, and I, I think right. what doesn't get said enough is many times the, the client in the plaintiff's case or a witness, it's their first time in this scenario. And this is a stressful experience. Uh, they're in a hall office building. They went up 50 floors. It's a conference table that's 25 feet long. There's a bunch of people in suits. It's not, it's not, it's an away game. And they're going to be uncomfortable. And then if you have a lawyer, hear the lawyer's questions. We don't really hear them. They don't, they don't sound that objectionable. I'm not even sure what the trigger was here in this deposition, but it, it was enough to put this guy over the edge. And, and so 
and, and sometimes you don't see it coming. Um, right. You know, uh, I, I had a deposition where I represented a young girl and before the admonition, before anything, the, the very first question was the most outrageous question I'd ever heard. And, it, you know, literally before he asked her name, he said, isn't it true you, you had an abortion? She was a 16 year old Catholic girl. And I terminated the deposition before she got to put her name on the record. But I mean, you, you see terrible things out there, but, you know, uh, but here, this just appears to be a, a difficult client and you gotta, you gotta find ways to take control and maintain that situation. Right. Yeah. And I said, you know, prep is part of that. You know, you see what pushes the button. Right. Exactly. He said, you know, shall we take a break? No, you just take a break. And, and, you know, if you need to terminate, you need to terminate and just till, I mean, hopefully you're not the one terminating, but uh, yeah, you, you have to, to work around that. And, you know, if you can suss that out in preparation, if you're at a firm, maybe talk to the lawyers and you know, maybe there's another lawyer who'd be better off defending it. Who's, you know, stronger or whatnot, you know, a better fit for that, but you have to take control of your client. Absolutely. And again, how it plays out in court is, you know, motion withdraws counsel um, you know, in many other ways. And, you know, when there've been litigants on the witness stand who have outbursts like that, and it's not good. I think everyone agrees. On that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move quickly through the next section here. Um, not that quickly. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing great on time. Mike. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, great then. Um, so we're going to discuss here argumentative nasty emails, letters, voicemails that may be coming in from your opponent. We kind of touched upon that already in some regards, but, you know, here are some examples. You save it and have a good laugh 10 years later. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, not so much. So you can see this is just uh, someone ranting in a, in a, in a letter uh, form, uh, and uh, it, gets, it gets worse as it goes along. I'm not even going to read it out loud. Right. Okay. Exhibit A to the motion of the court. However, you can get, <laughs> you know, exactly. however, whoever, how, whichever way you could get that before the court, <laughs> it's going to end up before the court somehow. Exactly. Yeah, and, and what's what's terrible about this letter and these all these letters is they're real letters. Um, I know. It's not like we said let's let's create an extreme example of the most outrageous behavior you think that might happen. I mean, right. these things happen. Some some licensed lawyer wrote these letters and, and, or maybe this one, the last one's a client, but it just, it shouldn't happen. Right. Yeah. Well, like the case with the Crawford case from, from the beginning of the presentation, stun gun and deposition, like you literally couldn't make that up. <laughs> like what's an outrageous example of conduct. Well, I, you know, no one makes that up. The, again, these are all real life examples of just, you know, should be obvious not to do this. Yeah. yeah. This is an interesting case. We put devoted several slides to it, um, and uh, it, it it arose out of a, a dispute over a an attorney fee referral referral fee, um, and, and it was one attorney was just trying to get the basis of the uh, uh, request for an attorney lien, and uh, so uh, he wrote a letter and saying um, this is from the court. This is the court's language here. When one of the attorneys finally said your conduct, uh, your lack of cooperation was unprofessional, the attorney wrote back and said this. It ended up not only just being in court, but being in a court of appeal. The attorney who got that letter that said you are a diminutive shit wrote back and says, I don't want your work product. You told me in our telephone conversation, your $20,000 plus lien was incurred obtaining and reviewing medical records. Uh, those records are not work product. I take it from your letter, you don't have any. My client has requested an itemization of your lien and we again respectfully request that itemization. John, what in the world would prompt you to write a letter like that? All we wanted was the medical records you told me you reviewed. If you don't have any, all you had to do is say so. Here's another example of the Knockbauer case 
where 5,000 sanctions were upheld against an attorney for writing a letter to the court uh, stating that his opponent's manner of practicing law indicates that she fits more as a clown in a circus attorney in the court of law. That same lawyer had had some problems before. Right. And kind of one thing to keep in mind for court, look, obviously, you know, judges, you know, follow the law and the case law and the statutory and, you know, merits in the law, but lawyers know there are many circumstances where the discretion of the court comes into play, whether it's, you know, granting continuance or relief or, you know, especially setting something or not specially setting or taking a break during your trial so you can attend to something. And, you know, if you're just that discourteous, you know, unethical, unprofessional lawyer who does these things, you know, courts are less likely to grant relief. And again, I've, I've seen many great lawyers in court and everyone screws up from time to time, shall we say. But if you screw up and the court knows this is a good lawyer, a professional lawyer, again, there may, let's just say there's a court hearing on your screw up. You know, the court may put that at the end of the calendar. So the other lawyers aren't sitting there during the calendar call hearing about your screw up, right? Um, you know, won't post a tentative ruling online so other people don't see what your screw up was. You know, there are ways that courts can, you know, kind of work with you to, again, if you screwed up, the court's going to rule a certain way, but to kind of minimize the impact to your professional reputation. Again, we won't call you up first with a courtroom full of people saying, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so, you screwed up, you know, you missed this deadline, you shouldn't have done this, and then everyone knows about it. So again, it's just, just be mindful of your professional reputation because there are discretionary calls. And again, you, know, you don't want your history of, you know, the hardball tactics that were referred to in, in the federal court case, never granting extensions. You are the one who sends these letters calling opposing counsel, you little this and that, and you piece of garbage. If you're that lawyer, again, you're gonna be coming before the court at some point in your career asking for a break. And does the court give it to you if they, the court doesn't have to? So the reputation is always important and it goes beyond any case. I think the lesson here is, is uh, in a couple of these slides. One was the response of the uh, new attorney to the uh, receipt of that letter was, hey, I'm surprised what caused you to write a letter like that. He, while he responded, he did not respond in kind. He did not take the bait. And this example of this Jack Daniels letter um, is when somebody was uh, questioning a trademark, um, uh, a violation of their trademark, and Jack Daniels was saying, hey, uh, while we are flattered that you would uh, uh, want to use our, our symbol um, or something so close to it that, um, you know, that, that you that you're providing us that kind of uh, publicity, we can't allow you to do it. It's an infringement of our trademark, et cetera. So what they did is, is, is a, this, this lawyer wrote this letter and kind of diffused it. And, 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 you know, um, it's in a transactional, more or less, but not a litigation setting, not yet. And uh, I think it's an example of, of don't respond in kind uh, to to uh, end civil conduct or even uh, conduct you want to. I can imagine this letter could have taken a different form and would not have been as successful. Right, well, and I think we've all been in that situation where opposing counsel does that. And I, I had a particularly contentious federal court case where opposing counsel was personally attacking me and I didn't rise to it. I just stuck to the case and whatever the motion was before the federal court, but the the, the district judge did a footnote saying, you know, basically saying, you know, appreciate efforts of you know, me not rising to take the bait because the correspondence was in the record. And of course, kind of like, we appreciate, you know, not responding to that. So again, we all know that, but again, to underscore judges don't like to see that. Judges just want to rule on the merits of the case and not get into the squabbles and the fights. And again, just underscore do not don't engage, just make your record professionally. Thank you. Well, that's an important one. Yeah, yeah. it's one Bad of the motives. principles. Yeah. It, it, it goes back to, you know, rise above it, model civil behavior and don't necessarily um, 
think the worst of somebody as though they're your enemy. Right. Yeah. If they don't return your co- phone call, it's not because they're <laughs> there may be a real reason they're not doing it. They're in trial. Yeah, and it, it, it could be, you know, we got to remember, we, we, we're all leading lives. And, you know, there may be something going on in your opposing counsel's life at this particular time that is affecting his or her behavior, that and it, it may be uh, something that they're going to get past. And so, you know, you got to give everybody the ability to, to, you know, be better. And, you know, but, but, you know, and again, if you know them, they might even share that with you you know, that, you know, I'm going through a divorce. I'm having an issue with drugs or alcohol. And, and, and then, you know, we can help each other. I mean, there's, you know, this again, we can't say it enough. This is a profession and we're all here to, to better, better the legal profession. So I want to get touch upon this. How can civility or the lack thereof affect the outcome of a mediation, the mediation process itself? All right. Well, I think we've, you know, there've been many presentations about the mindset for mediation is, you know, you're there to try to resolve the dispute, you know, avoid litigation. And if you go into it with an adversarial mindset, let alone an an, an civil one, it can just derail it. I mean, if you're that way, it could be the other side walk out and then, then what have you done? So it could just completely derail it. Again, it's, you know, is it in your client's best interest to try to resolve the case? You know, most of the time it is, but lawyers need to put aside that and see, you know, it's, it's the client's case and, and try to resolve it, but it, it can absolutely derail it. And people threaten to work out. Now you have to spend the next, you know, half an hour convincing this side not to walk away instead of working on something more productive. You know, I, I think a, a big change when, uh, a lot of us started in the practice, we would go to non-binding arbitrations. Um, and I think you would see the failure in a non-binding arbitration because everybody was, you know, puffing their chest out and trying to make their point. And then when mediation started, um, there was a, a period of time where joint sessions were in favor. And, and I think that was an opportunity to uh, have a, an episode of lack of civility that could derail the mediation. I, I think where we currently stand, at least in my mediations, I, I, unless it's requested by both sides and has some legitimate reason, I, I discourage a joint session because I think it's, it's a point in time where you can get off the rails before you start. Um, I like to keep everybody kind of calm and in their moment and then and have a real conversation about their case where they can speak freely to me uh, to try and help them because we're looking for a solution. We're looking, we're looking to avoid the big contentious trial. And, and so, you know, if, if, if people are there, they're not there to listen. Sometimes the, the lack of listening can in some ways be an act of incivility because they're, they're not there in good faith. They're not there to try and participate. Um, and, and, you know, that's, you know, how I look at it, which is, you know, I'm trying, I'm here to help. And, I'm, and, and but if you're not going to let me help, it, it, you know, I got to try and figure out why you're not letting me help. Um, and then if I can break that down, you know, then, then we don't get down on that path and we, we move forward. Right. The other thing that helps, like, for instance, you know, even though it's by Zoom, I'm in you know, the ADR Century City office and, or as well, but. I think one thing that helps when you're scheduling a mediation is, you know, maybe you do have that contentious relationship, if you will, with an, uh, with a lawyer on the other side, who's not civil or like that deponent who just flamed out over sea captain. If you know that's going on, maybe you do want to zoom mediation again, as much as we like being in person. Uh, I think it's helpful because, you know, even though we keep you in separate rooms, you may run into each other in the hallway or bathroom or, you know, just the Zoom format can help diffuse some of the incivility as well. So that's something to keep in mind, I think as well too, that that can help foster settlement if you're physically not in the same space. Those are, those are good insights. Thank you so much. Let's talk a little bit about civility in the courtroom. Uh, Judge Pfeffer, um, uh, what do you do if the trial judge is 
uncivil. Well, that never happened. So okay. not your not your courtroom, <laughs> Judge Faber. That's never happened before. Um, yeah, you know, you just obviously that's that's a challenge, and you know there are case law examples. The uh, it's in the materials. You know, the Halleck versus Rico case. It was an Orange Orange County Superior Court case in 2007, 151 Cal at Fourth Nine on Four of, you know, these antics of holding up, you know, you know, overruled and sustained cards and, you know, the penalty points, like it's a soccer game or something. It's, you know, uh, there was a, a, the published opinion on that decision and also the CJP issued opinion on it and discussed it. And so the transcript is there. Uh, I thought the judge, I mean, excuse me, the lawyer who was on the receiving end, in that case was the plaintiff's lawyer of, of that conduct, just did a very good job of keeping her calm being professional, making a record, right? That you see this twilight zone, you know, he's, he's doing this, just make your record again, as, as hard as it is. And it's hard if the judge is piling on and doing that, just everything's being reported, you know, in civil, you have to make sure you have your own reporter. If there's not one there, just just keep calm and carry on. But again, that's what, you know, you make your record for an appeal. You know, you didn't have a fair trial because the judge was acting a certain way. And again, that, uh, Halleck versus Rico case went to the uh, Commission on Judicial Performance and the CJP issued a formal admonition against this judge, but in exchange, it, it, there would have been more severe discipline, but the judge agreed to actually uh, resign from the bench. So that can happen. And there've been a few judges in the state of California in the last 15, 20 years who've had to step down because of lack of respect, lack of courtesy, et cetera. So make your record. Now, this court criticized the circus atmosphere, giving defendants lawyers Absolutely. to deride, make snide comments and start uh, singing or humming, whatever he was doing, uh, the Twilight Zone theme. Right. And that again, that judge had to step down because of this. So this case is also included in the materials, uh, or at least a cite to it. And, and uh, you can read it more formally. What about this case, Your Honor? Oh gosh, the Judge Judy tryout. Yeah, yes. I remember when that happened? Uh, we were, I mean, Mike, can you zoom in on that a little bit? I think it might be right. The judge in San Diego, and from what I could read, again, I just from reading, you know, the CJP opinion and whatnot, she was using her criminal court calendar as basically a tryout for a reality show. Of, yeah, you know, commenting on people. You know, just this again, circus atmosphere, not not judicial, not, you know, you know, not professional, not the way you should be. And there are other acts of misconduct and, and uh, the judge, you know, had to step down from what she was doing. And, you know, and that was all recorded and again. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a TV show. It's, it, it's, it's serious stuff. And I think most judges get it. And, and the judge always has to set the tone. Even if you have, you know, again, you have lawyers getting out of control. That's when, the, you know, the judge can call a break, just time for a break. That's it. <laughs> you don't have to say five minutes, just we're taking a break now. And then, you know, call lawyers and chambers. But the judge is always supposed to be in control and always be calm. And, uh, and it is challenging. There are challenging litigants, but this was a completely this situation had nothing to do with the litigants. They were, you know, terrified as heck. You know, I think the litigant called her, you know, sir. And she said, you know, it's, you know, I'm not a man. And, you know, people get flustered in court. They're nervous and judges have to understand that. But she created this kind of carnival atmosphere, like hoping to use that morning calendar as a, as a tryout for a reality show, which is totally inappropriate. So again, just make your record as, as a lawyer. Obviously you're not going to, it's unlikely you're going to encounter something that extreme, but just always be professional, always, you know, and if the judge is getting flustered, which judge shouldn't, but judges are people, you know, maybe, maybe you suggest a break if the court wants to keep going. Yeah. You know, we're reaching uh, 11 o'clock here and I think we can just kind of sum this yeah. up. That yeah. Hayward, Hayward has reappeared, which tells me we are out of time. Right. Uh, Mike, I, I just wanted to, conclude by uh, thanking everyone uh, for listening today, but also uh, uh, tell people that, uh, you know, if, if in, within your firm, you think there is a culture of lack of civility, 
uh, any of the local ABOTA chapters would be more than happy to come and make a presentation to your firm uh, and get hours for continuing education for free. And so, you know, Mike and I would, would come or, or, or anyone else. So, yeah. You know, if you're interested, reach out to us because we'd be more than happy to, happy to join. continue the message with the three of us.